Yep, we will be sharing the microphone. All right. Okay, you want to introduce Steve? Yes. So I think the microphone wasn't working. My microphone wasn't working. Anyway, I am introducing Steve. Steve Ray is a former Baptist and a convert to the Catholic Church and the author of many best-selling books, Crossing the Tiber, Upon This Rock, and St. John's Gospel. He speaks at conferences around the world. Steve and his wife, Janet, are certified guides to the Holy Land and lead pilgrimages throughout the Middle East and Rome. He is a writer, producer, and host of the 10-part video DVD series, The Footprints of God, the story of salvation from Abraham to Augustine, filmed entirely on location in the Holy Land and surrounding countries. From fierce critic to Catholic, Steve Ray is one of the most popular and sought after Catholic speakers of our time. In fact, I dare say he is the most evangelical, most animating storyteller that his explanation of the scriptures makes the Bible come alive. Watching him talk on his footprints of God, I could hear, like a movie, I could hear the footsteps of the young teenage Mary in the village as she comes out of her cave house with a jug in her head on her way to a muddy path to fetch water in the well with flies buzzing around her head. Like that, you're like you're watching a movie, literally. You gotta see the footprints of God. Anyway, so for the second time around having coffee conversations with this great man. Jude and I are delighted to welcome Steve Ray into our homes and yours. Welcome, Steve. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. I'm not quite sure what to do with an introduction like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm blushing. <laughs> You're welcome. How was your uh, 4th of July, Steve? Good. Just quiet and nice. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Same here. Since hey, we, uh, we have four kids and 18 grandkids, but they're all busy. But we were able to see some in Chicago and my daughter's coming with her to an almost born kid um, tomorrow. So we'll have them here for a few days. So, Oh, wow, nice, nice. We spent it with a friend at, at a friend's house and then we went home and um, studied American history and then read a book. So overall, it was, it was a pretty good 4th of July. Yes. Yeah. Good. Steve, do you know? Do you know? Do you know that since our last coffee conversations episode with you, that was in, on June sixth, we have had eighty nine thousand views. Eighty nine thousand views. I mean, we must have struck a chord because even when I post on Facebook, I, I'm lucky if I get three <laughs> likes. <laughs> but but eighty nine thousand views, and it's amazing. That's like a, a huge coliseum full of people who have uh, or heard you talk, and so we appreciate that you're truly spirit filled. Speaking of which, I, I always calculate sizes by the Michigan football stadium here in Ann Arbor, University of Michigan. Yeah. It holds 100,000 people. And I've been there many times, and I, it, it's just massive amount of people in that stadium. So when I hear 89,000, that's how I pictured it. it was that stadium almost full. Right, right. That's amazing. I mean, people. I talk on Islam, I did a talk on Islam, and it's already had over a million views. So that's that stadium filled 10 times. Holy wow. cow. Holy wow. cow. So that's, uh, yeah, that's amazing. People to God are be the glory. Anyway, Steve, speaking of um, uh, being spirit filled, would you mind leading us in a, in, a, in a prayer before we start? Sure. People say I still pray with a Protestant accent. So here we go. In the name of the Father, Son, the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Heavenly yeah. Father, we're grateful to you for time and the technology that you provided so that we can do things like this across the world. And we pray that as we discuss the Blessed Virgin Mary today, the mother of Jesus, the mother of God, that you would bless us, help us to have clarity of thought and mind and help a lot of people who have been confused by Protestant sects and cults and denominations, help them to see clearly what you really want them to know. We pray it in Jesus name. Amen. In the name of the Father, amen. Son, and the amen. Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Well, let uh, I think we should um, let's dive into that. Yes. If your microphone is not working, I'm hoping we're getting good audio. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, friends, we talked to you about. If for those of you who are joining us just now, we have as our guest um, the world-renowned Steve Ray, um, amazing, amazing uh, Catholic evangelist. 
Um, we, let's, let's dive into it. So, Steve, we have a question for you. Um, everybody knows that you are um, a Catholic convert. You were previously a Baptist. But people always speak of a second conversion. You know, uh, uh, the, the, this whole Mary thing, the Blessed Mother thing, is the obstacles of obstacles for most Protestants. So uh, when was it that you realized and you started to accept in your heart the dogmas uh, concerning uh, our Blessed Mother? Well, it wasn't um, uh, uh, maybe a little different than others, but it wasn't a second conversion for us so much as our main conversion process. It was the issue of authority. Once the issue of authority was resolved and the history of the teachings of the church, once I realized that the apostolic fathers, the very first Christians, believed what Catholics believe today, I was always raised that the early church was Protestant and it got corrupted by Catholic ideas. And only when Martin Luther came did we get real Christianity saved again and brought up out from underground and uh, real Christianity. But um, so the whole issue for us was authority in the early church. We tackled all of the issues. We tackled the papacy and authority in the church. We tackled Mary. We tackled the Eucharist and the real presence, the priesthood, confession, and all of the big issues, the big bugaboos, I call them, that we have been taught were all man-made traditions and had been added to the church later in time. So Mary was one of the many obstacles that we had in our way. And our impression was, is that Catholics worshiped Mary. They had made her the fourth person of the Trinity. And that doesn't work because Trinity means three. So how can you have a quadrinity and make Mary part of the Trinity? That's how we viewed that Catholics basically did. We as Baptists, we prayed to God. Catholics prayed to dead saints and Mary's dead and gone too. And they are praying to her. And we had all the misconceptions about Mary that most evangelical Bible-believing Christians have. And so when we tackled the issues of Mary, it was along with all of the other issues. And we realized that the early church had much, had the same ideas and teachings on Mary that the Catholic church taught today. And the idea that Mary had other children, that she was a sinner, that she was dead and gone, were not part of the early Christianity. That was all something that came later with the Protestant uh, deformation. I won't call it a de Protestant reformation because they didn't reform anything. They devolved. It was a devolution. It was a, a schism. It was a disaster. So the issues of Mary, my wife and I came to conclusions in different routes. We, she read a book, and it's actually a treatise by St. Jerome in the 300s, and it was against a man named Helvidius. And Helvidius was espousing an idea that had never been taught before that was completely radical to the early Christianity. And he was espousing the idea that Mary had other children. And St. Jerome got his shotgun out and he gave both barrels right into Helvidius' face. I'm serious. You read that document and you see that he is just outraged that anyone would dare say that. No one has ever suggested such a thing that Mary had other children. She was an ever virgin. And when my wife read that, she said, you know what? That just answered all my questions about Mary. The early church was correct and we're wrong. For me, it was this little booklet called Mary the Second Eve. It's mm -hmm. a compilation of writings of John Henry Newman, who's now a saint, Cardinal mm -hmm. John Henry Newman. And he what he did, it did in this book is showed how the early Christians, from the very beginning, what they believed about Mary. And especially what struck me, this is really the book that tipped the, tipped the scales for me. After this book, I said, okay, I'm, I'm Catholic in, in the views of Mary. That's, that's done. I was wrong. Catholic Church is right. Okay, let's admit it. Let's eat some humble pie here. When you have three of the great Christian apologists, theologians, and writers all in the second century, still within very close to the lifetime of the last apostle John. And they're all referring to Mary as the second Eve. They're all saying that in the Garden of Eden, there was a, an immaculate conception, a virgin named Eve. And that virgin, immaculate conception, listened to an corrupt angel, 
and she believed the angel and therefore tied the knot of sin, brought sin into the world. The new Eve, Mary, the new Eve, the second Eve, she, also being an immaculate conceived virgin, listened to an angel and brought truth and forgiveness and righteousness back into the world. When you have these three guys, Justin Martyr, born in 120, died with his head cut off, Irenaeus and Tertullian, Justin Martyr represents Palestine area. That's way over in the east. Irenaeus represents what's France of today, and Tertullian represents North Africa and Rome. So you've got the far extents of the Roman Empire, and all of them are talking about Mary as the second Eve, the immaculately conceived virgin. That really has imp impressed me because we didn't have Twitter and Zoom like we're using right now. They didn't have the ability to communicate across the Roman Empire like we did. These three guys were excellent theologians. Protestants love them even today, too. And they were teaching the truth from three extreme extents of the Roman Empire, all teaching the very same thing what the Catholic Church teaches about Mary today. And they were not, and I'll close with this, they were not teaching it as though it was a novelty, that they were just coming up with these ideas. They were teaching it as something they had learned from the apostles. So when I read this book about Mary being the second Eve and her importance, uh, my wife's, one of my fav uh, wife's favorite um, devotions, I'm going to grab it right here. It's called Mary, Mary the Untire of Knots. The fathers of the church said that Eve, in a garden, tied the knot of sin. Mary, in a new garden, the new Eve, she untied the knot of sin. That doesn't mean Mary died for our sins. That's not what we're talking about. But just like Eve made the way for Adam to fall into sin, Mary made the way for her son to bring us out of that sin. So that's, in a nutshell, that's how my wife and I came to accept the idea. And I also will say this, and then I'll be quiet for a minute. Um, I learned more about Mary from the Old Testament than from the New Testament. Mary is, the Old Testament is loaded with Mary. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear and who understand the mm -hmm. Old Testament and what's called typology, where you see things in the Old Testament that represent things that are coming in the New Testament. So typology shows us things, for example, when the children of Israel went through the Red Sea, that represents water baptism. And it is a picture, a type, a symbol, a prefiguration of water baptism. The Old Testament is full of Mary. Hopefully we'll get into some of that today. And my wife and I learned more about Mary from the Old Testament and the early Christians, even than from the New Testament. And then the New Testament was like the flower. When you read the New Testament, then all of the Marian dogmas make sense. Okay. So Steve, my question there is why do Catholics give so much attention to Mary? Why be, be Protestants believe that we worship her? And they refer to this scripture from Luke 4 8, get behind me, Satan, for you shall only worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. Well, the reason that Mary holds such a special place is because she is the chosen daughter of the father. She is a chosen mother of the son. And she is the chosen spouse of the Holy Spirit. What other person on the face of the earth could ever claim to have that relationship with the Trinity? This relationship with the Trinity is completely unique because Mary took all of the, has all of those characteristics. And she became, she said yes to the angel. And she gave birth to Jesus who was not, as a Protestant, I would only say that Mary was the mother of Jesus. But as a Catholic, I realize it's correct to say that Mary's the mother of God. That doesn't mean she's the mother of the Trinity. That would be foolish to even think of that. That's what Protestants accuse us of when we say Mary's the mother of God. Oh, so you think she's the mother of the Trinity? No, Jesus is a divine person. He only is one person. He's not a human person and a divine person. He is one person, a divine person, who has two natures, human and divine nature. Mary gave birth to him. He is God. Therefore, she is the mother of that God-man. 
She's the mother of that divine person, not the Father and the Holy Spirit, not the Trinity. But when Jesus decided to come down, the second person, the Trinity, to become a man, Mary was the one who said yes, and she became the mother of God, and she became the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So the fact that she did that, Jesus has Mary's DNA. The genetic code, if you took Jesus' cells and you put them under a microscope to check his DNA, it's the DNA of Mary. He doesn't have the DNA from an earthly father. Her, his DNA came from Mary. And he is in heaven to this day, was still with a physical body, Jesus is. And he still, for all of eternity, will have the DNA of Mary. And for the first three years of his life, the mothers breastfed their babies for three years back in those times. Every cell in his body was nourished and given life. He grew from the milk of his mother Mary. Mary is very special. Also, if we look at it from Jesus's perspective, the law, one of the Ten Commandments is, honor your father and your mother, and you will live long on the earth. It's the only command that we have that's attached with a promise. Jesus would have honored and loved his mother more than anyone else would. He would do that, obey that law better than anyone else by loving his mother. And if G we love what Jesus loves, then we better also honor and love his mother, or we're going to be in trouble when we stand before him someday. And uh, th that's just a little bit. Of, I mean, you could go on and on about why Mary is special, why we honor her. Now, an another aspect is, is Jesus is what? He's the king of Israel. When the angel came to Mary at the, uh, I'm going to show you what Mary looked like. Just a second. I just printed this out. I give you an idea what I think Mary looked like in Nazareth. This is a picture of the girls at the well in Nazareth where Mary went to get water. This is over a hundred mm -hmm. years ago, the picture. Wow. Mm -hmm. Look at their feet. Look at look at the That's right. The, no sandals, right. dirty little feet walking through the mud and the manure, because this is all animals that live there too, going to the mm -hmm. well to get water. And Mary when she was on, she's at the well, she, she was, um, the Holy Spirit chose her and she said, yes, the whole idea of Mary having, being special. When you think of what the angel said to her that morning, when she went to the well, that you're going to give birth to a son and he will sit on the throne of his father, David. There's not been a king in Israel for over 600 years. And Mary is being told that she's going to be the mother of the king. Now, in, if anybody knows their Old Testament, and I'll tell you, most Catholics and most Protestants don't know their Old Testaments. A lot of these people leave the Catholic Church to become Protestant, don't have a clue what the Old Testament teaches. Mm -hmm. They've only been taught that one thing, don't make images, don't make mm -hmm. images, don't make images. The only, that's probably about the only verse they know from the Old Testament, and that's because somebody just told them to get them out of the Catholic Church. But the fact is, is that the king always had a queen, starting with Solomon. First Kings chapter two, verse 19. Solomon, his mother came into the throne room. Solomon got up off his throne. He prostrated himself to his mother. And then he built a throne at his right hand where his mother would sit. And there now from that point on, Solomon, the young man ruled in the kingdom with his queen mother ruling next to him. And she was an intercessor for the people. Ding, 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 does that ring a bell? Mm -hmm. And she ruled. And from that point on, all the kings of Israel had a queen. It was always their mother, not their wife. And she ruled with them in the kingdom. If Jesus is the king of Israel and he's a better king than Solomon, then what is he not going to raise his mother up to be the queen? This is what I'm talking about. When you understand the Old Testament, the New Testament comes alive and the Catholic Church is only confirmed in everything it teaches. That's right. That's right. That's right. Steve, you know, just, just to be clear for our, uh, for our viewers who are just uh, tuning in, we're talking about Mary and um, trying to address the issues about what's the big fuss about the Blessed Mother, right? Steve, a while ago, you were alluding to typology, the, uh, the text. connection text. between um, the Old Testament and New Testament as it pertains to Mary. There is a, a richness and a significant fullness in associating the Ark of the Covenant with the Virgin Mary as the new Ark of the Covenant. You, do you want to talk about that? This is what I call my statue of Mary. Uh huh. Wow. Mm -hmm. Does anybody recognize what that is? These are the yes. Kohathites. This was a tribe of Levi, the men, priests, who carried the Ark of the Covenant. This was an Ark. Oh, and by the way, 
God said in, in uh, Exodus 20, don't make any images of anything above the earth, on the earth, or below the earth. Don't make any images. And five chapters later, God forgot what he said. <laughs> and he told them to make angels mm -hmm. and put the angels on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. Just being a little facetious here. Yep. Yeah. Right. But obviously, it was not the making of images that was the big problem, but the bowing down and worshiping and making these images gods. Exactly. So this is an Ark of the New Covenant. And I say it's my statue of Mary because Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. That what I just showed you is a type. It's something in the Old Testament that represents or prefigures something that's going to come in the New Covenant under the Messiah. In the Old Covenant, you had this Ark. It was a box about four feet long, two and a half feet, two and a half feet. It was, it was made of acacia wood lined with pure gold, which represents her immaculate conception, her purity, and her royalty as well. Inside that Ark was the uh, tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments that God had written with his own finger. There was also in there the urn of manna from the wilderness and a stick that proved the priesthood of Aaron. When Moses prayed at the end of Exodus, I love to ask Catholics or Protestants, what did Mary think of when she heard the angel say to her, the Holy One will overshadow you and that which is in you will be the holy thing of God. That's what it says in the Greek. Mary immediately thought of Exodus chapter 40. How many Catholics or Protestants think of Exodus chapter 40 when they hear the angel's words to Mary, that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you? Well, Mary did because she knew her Bible. Mary said, oh my goodness, I know what that means. In the Old Testament, the only other time that word is used is when Moses built that Ark of the Covenant. He set it in the tabernacle. He stepped back to pray, and it said the Holy Spirit of God overshadowed the ark. And that which was in that ark was the word of God because it was on stone inside. Mary, when she heard the word, said, oh, I'm going to be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, and that which will be in me is the word of God, not in stone, but in flesh. Mm -hmm. Mary knew she was going to be the ark of the new covenant. And when you go to the visitation, when I take my groups to, this is, I give this talk every time I take my groups to Ein Kerem, which is a subdivision of Jerusalem. It's the place of the visitation. And I say that when Mary got there, it says she went to the hill country of Judea. Elizabeth said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? John the Baptist leaps and dances in his mother's womb. Mary stayed there for three months, and everyone in the house was blessed. The word blessed is used two or three times in that passage. Well, I ask then Catholics and Protestants, what does that make you think of Second Chapter, Second Samuel chapter six of the Bible? And they all know, I don't know, I don't know. What is Second Samuel chapter six? It's the type. It's why Luke says what he says in the visitation. He says those words specifically because he is pointing back to the Old Testament. And he is, for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, they'll, Luke is trying to tell you who Mary is, who and what Mary is. Because David, King David, had brought the Ark of the Covenant into the hill country of Judea. Mary came into the hill country of Judea. Ja David leaped and danced in front of the Ark. John the Baptist leaped and danced in front of the Ark. David said, who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? Mary Elizabeth said, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? It says that David left the ark of the covenant in the hill country of Judea in the house of Obed-Edom. He left it there for three months. Luke tells us Mary stayed for three months and everyone in both houses were blessed. Do you think for one minute that that's by chance? That those parallels were just by chance. And Luke said, oh, I, don't, I didn't know. Are you kidding? Luke, by the work of the Holy Spirit, embedded that into the Gospel of Luke so that we who take the Bible seriously, Old and New Testament, will be able to understand that Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. And then if you want to top it off even more, you get to the end of Revelation or the middle of the book of Revelation. And what happens in, in the Bible is, unfortunately, it has chapters and verses. That's good for us because it helps us find things. But it's also bad for us because it divides the books up when there shouldn't be. So we get our Bibles out, and we have them on our nightstand at night. And we read Revelation chapter 11, and it ends with verse 19, which says, 
And I looked into the heavens and behold, I saw the tabernacle and it was opened and there was the Ark of the Covenant. That's the end. Close your Bible, go to sleep, get up the next and come back the next night. And you open up and you start reading chapter 12. Behold, I saw the woman in the clouds. I saw the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, with a crown of 12 stars in her head. And she, she's the one that gives birth to the one who rules the world with a rod of iron. So we read that, but we divide it up. What does John, when he wrote the book, it was all one text. There were no chapters and verses. And here's what he sees. He sees in heaven the woman as the Ark of the Covenant. And then he sees the woman as the queen. She's both. So all based on the Old Testament. So if you don't understand the Old Testament, you're never going to understand the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. So this is the way it should be read. Behold, I looked into the heavens and I saw the tabernacle and it was opened and there was the Ark of the Covenant. Mary. Behold, I saw the woman, Mary, clothed with a sun, with the moon under her feet. And she's the queen of heaven. She's the Ark of the Covenant. And John is telling us that in his Bible, all the way from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, Mary is there if you have eyes to see it. And the gospels only make it all the more clear. But most people don't care. Most people don't read their Bible. Most people don't study it. They just listen to what other people say. And, um, unfortunately they miss so much that way but these are the reasons that my wife and i accepted the teachings about mary and we believe what the catholic church it's not only in my movie i made on mary here i'd show you this too this is my movie mary mother of god mm -hmm. and we filmed it all on location all through israel and the palestinian areas and in turkey where she lived in ephesus and even on the island of patmos in the mediterranean where john saw her as the queen so these things those are some of the few reasons why Janet and I have accepted the Catholic teachings on Mary. And in that movie, I conclude, not only are they true, the teachings on Mary, the church has always taught, not only are they true, but they're beautiful. Right, right. It's undeniable that there is such an association um, between the Ark of the Covenant and the New Covenant, which is Mary. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments. Uh, it was written in stone, a pot of manna and uh, Aaron's rod that came back to life. And the womb of the virgin contained Jesus, the, the living word and fleshed, and um, the branch, which is also a messianic title, and uh, about who would die but come back to life. Uh, uh, it's, it's truly undeniable. When you said, one of the things that you've mentioned, Steve, uh, about, um, about uh, Elizabeth exclaiming with a loud cry in Luke 1, 42, uh, the joy of the presence within Mary, and she says, uh, why is this granted unto me that the mother of the Lord should come to me? It is often asked, well, the title Lord can be used for someone who has great titles, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it may not really uh, pertain to, uh, to God, but when you associate it with uh, 2 Samuel uh, 6 and 9, and when David asked, how is it that the ark of the Lord comes to me? There is no doubt that, uh, that David was pertaining to God. And so that kind of association really um, you just swap it out. Swap it out. The parallels are: David said, "Ark of the Lord." Elizabeth says, "Mother of my Lord." Mm -hmm. The Lord is God in both of them. The word Adonai is referring to God in the New Testament. That's the way it's being used here. So when David says, "This is the Ark of God," the Ark of the Lord, Yahweh, the Ark of God. Elizabeth is saying the same thing. You just swap the words out. It's mm -hmm. the same words being used. You just swap them out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's the Lord who's, she's the mother of the Lord. She's the mother of God. What, Mary, what Elizabeth is saying is this is the mother of God. Yeah. So true, so true. So how can Catholics believe Mary was conceived without original sin? You know, the, the dogma of Immaculate Conception came much later in 1854 by, by Pope Pius IX. And so uh, we're often accused of making things up as we go. Uh, well, what happens is that's a very perverted and skewed way of viewing the doctrines of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Really, truly the way it would better be said is that doctrines are defined only when they're challenged. For example, we believe that Jesus is both God and man. He's both human and divine. And why have we come to those definitions that he is a second person of the Trinity, a member of the Trinity, second person? The Bible never tells us that. Never does the Bible say Jesus is a member of the Trinity. The word Trinity is not even used in the Bible, for heaven's sakes. 
So why do we come to that? Because in the early church, there were people like the Arians and others who challenged and said that Jesus was not eternal. He was not God. He was only a creature like all of us, only a higher level of creature, maybe a high level of an angel somehow. And because the church knew that that was wrong, they, it was that doctrine was challenged. It was already believed by the early Christians, but when it became challenged, they got the councils together and they defined it. The later something is defined actually means that it was accepted more and it wasn't challenged till much later. If something's not defined until a thousand years later, usually you can say, well, that was because it was accepted for the first thousand years. Nobody really challenged it. And it wasn't until they challenged it that somebody had to, the councils had to define it more carefully so that we are clear. It's the, it's the fixing of a problem. So when we say that Mary's, uh, her, her immaculate conception was defined later, that's because it was something that wasn't contested. Now there, there's different views of how that, what that means. But the early Christians, Augustine and those all said that she is the Holy One of God. Do not ever let me hear anyone speak of sin related to Mary. I will cover my ears and run from the room. The early Christians totally accepted the fact that Mary was sinless. Now, it wasn't defined that it was until conception until later, because the church then defined it very carefully. Even Thomas Aquinas believed that Mary was sanctified from her mother's womb. He didn't say from conception. He just said before she was born, somewhere in her. But the church finally said, well, this is when she was made holy. This is at that point. And you can see that even with the words of the angel when he comes to Mary, that little girl who is with her dirty little feet coming back from the well. Mm -hmm. When Mary arrives back at her cave, the angel comes and says, Hail Mary, correct? No, he didn't say Hail Mary. He said, Hail Kahare Tomene. I think I had that word written here, but I'll find it here in a second. But he said, Hail Kahare Tomene, which means Hail one who has been, here it is, this is what it looks like in the Greek. The top line is the Greek letters. The bottom line is transliterated into English characters. That is Mary's name. John Paul II said that's Mary's name in the eyes of God, Kahare Tomene. Mm -hmm. When Mary heard the words hail, or really what that word is too, is it's a, it's a greeting that says rejoice. Mm -hmm. Rejoice, Kahare Tomene. What does Kahare Tomene mean? It means one who has, Greek language, by the way, is much more sophisticated than English. And in one word, it says all of this. First, it's in the passive tense, which means it's something done to you, not something that you did. It's something that's been done to you. You are the passive recipient of this. You who, it has a past component. You who were made full of grace. You who were completed in grace in the past and who are now in that same state today. So it has a past and a present component, that word. Anybody can look up that Greek word and find out what it means. I have a program called Logos. I just click the button and boom, there it all is. to the passive, um, past participle, whatever. So what you have is you, it's been done to you, you were perfected in grace in the past, and you remain in that state today. That's Mary's name in the eyes of God. He doesn't look down and see Mary. He looks down and sees Kahare Tomeni, the one that I perfected in grace. So what is grace? Grace is the life of God. God grace is a something. It's not just, it, it's two things. One, when we were Protestants, we said grace was the acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense. And it's true. Grace is undeserved favor that we receive from God, paid for by the merits of Jesus Christ. God's riches at Christ's expense. And we're given that. But it's also a thing. Grace is actually the life of God that was put right into our souls. When Adam and Eve sinned, the devil says, You're, you won't die. God says you'll die. God's a liar. You won't die. And if you eat this fruit and watch, she ate the fruit. She didn't die. Well, God must be a liar. I didn't die. I'm still here. But something did die. What died? The spiritual life that God had put in their souls died. The sanctifying grace, the grace of God's life had died within them. And it was through Jesus that that grace was able to be brought back to all of us through the works of his. And it was applied to people before the death of Christ by faith. And it's applied to those after they looked forward to it. We look back at it, but it's the same event that brought grace to anybody past or present. And when he says the grace of God 
is the very life of God, and Mary is full of the life of God. That's what grace means. You who have been made full of grace, who have been perfect. And if Mary is full of grace, that means that there's nothing else in her like sin. If, if I have a bottle of pure water here, that means there's nothing else in it. If Mary is full of the life of God, there's nothing else that's in there to contaminate it, which means she's sinless. And the church taught that from the very beginning. Even in her title, Kahare Tomene, is the bedrock of the idea of the Immaculate Conception. Now, let's look at typology. Eve was in the garden, and she was immaculately conceived as well. She didn't have any sin, right. and she, didn't, she did, it was without sin in a garden. Mary now, wouldn't it be appropriate that we're starting the new creation and Mary is the new Eve? What, 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 what good is it to say, well, Mary's a sinner? That's not parallel. Eve was without sin. Mary was without sin to start the new creation. And it's interesting that in the, in the garden where the, tr where the tree was, we have a new garden and John I have my book on John too. You already showed it, but in my book on John, I go into detail on this. He makes sure you know that the cross and the tomb are in a garden because he wants you to think of the parallels between the two. And so there you have at the, at the cross, who do you have? You have the new Adam and you have the new Eve. Mary is at the foot of the, that's why she's at the foot of the cross. She's at the foot of the new tree. The first garden had a tree of life, which brought about death. The new garden has the tree of death, which brought about life. Jesus, Adam and Eve were naked in the garden in their innocence, and they had to be dressed and kicked out because of their sin. Jesus was dressed outside of the garden and brought in and stripped naked to restore the innocence at a new tree in a new garden. So you have these parallels, and Mary is a part of that. Mary is the immaculate conception who is going to give birth to a new humanity because Eve was an immaculate conception, also a sinless virgin at the moment of her sin. So the parallels are so incredible, but a lot of people don't know them because they haven't read about them or learned about them. And that's a shame, and we as Catholics ought to be teaching this, shouting it from the rooftops. People wouldn't leave the Catholic Church if they knew how beautiful all of the teachings were and how biblical they are. Exactly. I, I echo that sentiment because as a youth, being raised and, and uh, educated in a Catholic school, I never really quite understood the, the dogma of Immaculate Conception, except that we celebrate it on is it December 8th, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So speaking of Immaculate Conception and the dogma of Mary being sinless, I have a question on that. How can Catholics believe, how can we believe that Mary is conceived without original sin when Romans 3.23 would tell us that all have sinner deprived of the glory of God. Well, if you, when you hear a quote, that is a quote from the Old Testament, by the way, and I'm going to go to it since you brought it up. Um, I don't have time to do that. I'm just going to explain it. Psalm yeah. 19 talks about how the all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is a quote, actually, what you just read is a quote from Romans. It's a quote from Psalm 19. And when you use a quote, when Paul quotes something in the Old Testament, he doesn't take it out of context. It is also in the context of the Old Testament. And you have to read the whole Psalm. Because as soon as it says, oh, I am going to go to it just for the fun of it here. <laughs> sure. I love having it all on the computer. See if I can find it quick enough here. But as you're doing that, Steve, um, you know, uh, we, we, we saw Mary, your, your video yeah. on, on, uh, on salvation. There was a great depiction that you did there when you fell in the mud and you talked yep. about two ways of salvation. Exactly. Well, let me do that then. That's easier and it's more fun to do it that okay. way. Right. Um, for, but I will make the comment. Then it's, in Psalm 19, that's where Paul gets that verse. And in the context, it says that all of those who are sinful and fallen away from God. But then right below that, it says, but my righteous ones. So in other words, even in the Psalm that is quoted, it's not saying that all have fallen away. There are some who have, but, the, but there are still those who are righteous before God. So it's, Paul is not trying to say that every single person. Paul in Romans, you have to realize, and this is what people, this is what Protestants do. They like sound bites. They love little marketing slogans. They don't want to read the whole passage and understand the whole thing. In the book of Romans, Paul is saying there's two categories of people. 
there are Jews and there are Gentiles. You Jews think you're righteous because you're from the loins of Abraham. Therefore, you say, I am righteous. But the Gentiles are not. What he's doing is saying that all have sinned, Jews and Gentiles. Don't just point at the Gentiles and say they're sinners, because yes, they are. But so are you Jews. All have sinned. He's not talking about individuals there. He's talking about these two camps. And he's explaining to the Jews, just like in Rome in Psalm 19, that there are some who are righteous. The Jews and the Gentiles are two categories. Both are sinful, but it doesn't say that all. Some of the Jews are righteous before God. And, and then this, so I'll switch now. To, and one other thing is so, so much to say. I would like, we'd like to be three people right now saying three different things. <laughs> But there are exceptions. If you say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, then I would say, if there's one exception, will you accept that uh, that, that doesn't mean everyone? Well, yes, of course, because it says all. What about Jesus? Jesus was a man who walked on the face of the earth. He had been alive prior to Romans being written. Are you going to say that he had sinned as well? He was born of a woman. He was born under the law. Are you going to say that Jesus sinned also? Well, no, not Jesus. Okay, what about those who have Down syndrome or mentally re retarded folks or those who don't have the capability? Even in Protestant eyes, they say they have not reached the age of accountability or they do not have the accountability mental acumen to make these decisions. Are they also all sinners? Are they all going to hell because they're sinners too? Well, no. You have to, even though you know a two-year-old is not a sinner because they, they don't have the choice and the ability to understand what sin is to violate the law of God. So there's already exceptions to the rule. Mm -hmm. A baby gets aborted. Is that baby also without his sin? No. So even the Protestants have to admit there's exceptions to the, for all have sinned. Now, does Mary need a savior? Of course she needs a savior. And here's how it works. If in, in my movie, oh, first of all, let me say it this way. I like to ask Catholics and challenge them about these things. Because Catholics need to be challenged because they don't know their faith. The vast majority don't know their faith. So I like to challenge them. And when I was beforehand, when I was a Protestant, I used to try to convert Catholics to leave the Catholic Church. And I'd ask them this verse. In the visitation, when Mary is there with Elizabeth, we've already talked about that today. She sings this wonderful song called the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So he, she's the Savior oh, there. Oh, <laughs> so you just said Catholics have to admit that Mary, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says she needs a Savior. Mm -hmm. Who needs a Savior but a sinner? Mary must have been a sinner if she said she needs a Savior. Well, all of a sudden the Catholic goes, <gasps> what mm -hmm. are you going to say now? Well, of course. So in my movie, Mary, Mother of God, and I know you've seen this scene where I fall in the mud because nobody, everybody that watches it, all my movies say that's the one scene they remember the most. Oh, that's uh -huh. true. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so in that movie, I say that Mary says she needs a savior. So let's take a look at this. Now we had made, I had a pathway and we made a big puddle of mud. We dug a hole, put plastic liner in it, and I filled it with black dirt and filled it with water. It was a, it was horrible. It was a squishy, messy mess. We put in front of that a log, a big log of wood. And as I'm walking, I say, well, let's discuss it this way. There are two ways. If we say that this mud, puddle of mud is like sin, there are two ways to be saved from a puddle of mud. I always want to say muddle of pud, but it's... <laughs> puddle of mud. So I'm walking towards the puddle of mud and I trip and I said, the boom, I fall in head first into the mud puddle and my, it's all over, I'm just covered with mud. And a hand pulls me up and I say, <laughs> the first way to be saved from a puddle of mud is to be pulled out and cleaned up. That's us. Mm -hmm. Sinners being baptized, washed from our sins, blood of Christ, all of this, we're cleaned up after we are sinners. Then it rewinds. <laughs> like a video and now i'm coming at the mud puddle again and you're saying to yourself oh no that idiot's not going to fall in the mud again is he and this time i trip and i fall but a hand reaches out and stops me on the way down and pushes me back and i say the second way to be saved from a puddle of mud is to be prevented from falling into the mud in the first place mary was a daughter of eve she was subject to sin like the rest of us but by a unique act of God, based on the merits of her son, 
Mary was present, prevented from falling into sin. She was the immaculate conception because it was appropriate to the calling that God had given her to become the mother of God, this very unique to be the spouse of the Holy Spirit and the mother of God and bring Jesus, the God-man, into the world without an earthly father. And so she was being prepared for that in advance. God gave her that grace in advance of the Immaculate Conception of being without sin so that she would be able to very appropriately be that mother of God. Not that, like Aquinas said, it was not necessary for her to be that way, but it was a grace that God gave her because of her yes, because he knew what she was going to say. So yes, Mary was subject to sin like the rest of us, but by a unique act of God, she was prevented from falling into the mud puddle. Now any eight-year-old kid can explain the Immaculate Conception, right? Just take your friend out, push him into a mud puddle and say, now let me explain to you what the Immaculate Conception is. Any eight-year-old can understand it when you use the mud puddle. And that's amazing. That's why in Mary, we see all the promises and grace of God concretized. Uh, in a human form, if, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, outside of the Godhead. And, and, and without preaching, you know, uh, uh, Mary doesn't speak so much in the Bible, but without preaching, she has showed the fullness of the gospel by just being who she is. Um, and she preaches too, because she says, do whatever he tells you. Right, that's amazing. We can, let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's talk about that. <laughs> because um, they, uh, th there is such a... Um, a misconception about what Jesus said when, she, when he apparently quote unquote rebuked Mother Mary or the Blessed Mother during the wedding in Cana when Mother Mary said, well, could you help these people out? And Jesus, said, and Jesus says, well, it is not yet my time, woman. For me, and this is maybe not theological, for me, it's like our, our kids, right? We tell our kids, Skylar, go ahead and clean up your room. And he goes, well, no, I'm not going to do that now. But we have confidence that he's going to do it. And, and then we say, after you do that, come down and have dinner. We know he's going to come down. We know he's going to do it. He says he's not going to do it. But we know, and you know as the mother, that he's going to do it. That, that's how you know. Uh, well, uh, even in uh, New Testament times, when we take our groups there, I have my local guide who is a Christian, a Palestinian, whose family has lived in the Holy Land since the beginning. And he'll tell you that in the, in the Middle East, the mothers are far more powerful than the fathers. Women hold a great place of power in the culture and in the family. And if a mother tells her son to do something, he doesn't do, disobey her. He does what he does. And he says that in, in a wedding, and I've been to weddings in, uh, with my Palestinian Christian friends there, and the men and women are separated. Because the men are over here talking and the women are over here doing their thing. And what happened is Mary finds out that they've run out of wine, which is a huge embarrassment because people have traveled most of the time from many miles away to come to this wedding and they're counting on you to provide all of their needs. And wine is one of the most important things. Do you said, so do you think Jews could have fun at a wedding without wine? So they all have, they have wine, but they've run out. They've miscalculated on the third day and weddings are seven days long. So the wedding's not even half over yet and they're already out of wine. This is a huge disaster. So Mary goes from the women over here into the men's section. She stands in the doorway and she look, gets her son, her eye son, and she says, come here, come here, boy. Come here and talk to me. So Jesus comes out and talks to her. And, you know, we sing the song, gentle woman. <laughs> Mary's a Jewish mother. Are you kidding me, gentle woman? Come here, boy. Come here, Jesus. She calls him out of the crowd. She said, they have no wine. He knows exactly what she's asking or telling. Because he says three things. Woman, what does that have to do with you and I? My hour has not yet come. What do those three things mean? First of all, woman. If I said to my mother when I was a young man, she told me this time, I said, woman, I'm not going to, that's not my time. Don't you talk to me like that, young man. I'm your mother. But in those days, woman was a title of honor. It was an honorable title. Plus, John is telling us something there. In the beginning of the gospel, what does he call his mother? Woman. And at the cross, what does he call his mother? Woman. Why woman? Because in Genesis 3, 15, in the garden, and now they're in a new garden, in the old garden of Eden, God says to the devil, I will bring enmity, warfare between you and the woman. 
And I'm convinced John there is pointing you back and saying, when, when Jesus calls his mother woman, he's letting you know she's the woman of Genesis 3.15 who's going to do war with the devil. And if you saw Mel Gibson's movie, you saw that the devil in Mel Gibson's movie is always watching Mary. He's watching. He does not like that woman. He's scared to death of that something. She's up to something. Odd. Who is she anyway? And so you have that, that contrast. Now, Mary, also, uh, what does that have to do with you and me? In other words, Jesus is saying, Mom, we're just visitors here. This isn't our wedding. This isn't our thing, you know. But Mary is an intercessor for the people. And she still is. And then Jesus says, my hour is not yet come. What hour does he mean? He means the hour when he does his first miracle and the world sees who he is and then everything is going to change. He's no longer going to come home to the cave with mom. And mom, when Mary said, by the way, do whatever he tells you, she said that with a tear in her eye because it was her way of saying goodbye to her son. He's 30 years old. She's been taking care of him morning, noon, and night. She makes his meals. She, she prays with him at night. They sleep on their mats with Joseph in the cave. But Joseph is gone. It's just her and Jesus there. And now she says she knows it's time for him to start his earthly ministry. Who told Jesus when to start his ministry? He said, it's not yet my time. And she said, yes, it is, son, do it. And he did it. Jesus said, it's not time to start my earthly ministry. His mother said it is, and he obeyed his mother against his own wishes. So Mary says, do whatever he tells you. She is saying something to all Christians there, do whatever he tells you. Mm -hmm. And when she said, do whatever he tells you, she didn't even talk to him anymore. She just said, son, they have no wine. He says these things to her. She tells him, and tell him anything. She just turns away from her son, says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And she walked back over to the women's section. She knew her son would have to do what, he, what she told him to do. Jesus turned the water into wine and his ministry began. And Mary no longer had Jesus come to her cave anymore. He, she didn't get, see him coming over the hill at the end of the day, coming home for dinner. When she said, do whatever he tells you, there were tears in her eyes because she was saying, goodbye, son. I love you and I'm going to miss you, but it's time for you now to go out and do your heavenly father's work. It's been nice to have you for 30 years all to myself, mm. but goodbye, son. And she yeah. turned around with tears in her eyes and walked back to the women. But Mary was an intercessor for the people and Jesus did what his mother interceded to have done. Mm -hmm. Wow. As a mother, I I find that, see, that's the beauty of having Mary to intercede for you because as a mother, if I say that, and I know that my son, that's the beginning of his ministry and he won't be with me anymore. What an, it's complete obedience, even to, to a fault where she's going to have to lose her son after starting from there. And, and that is why what, when you explain to us that the typology, the study of types of Mary in, seen in the old and mm -hmm. revealed in the new, it just makes more sense that we go to Mary with Mary. We don't worship Mary like God, but he, now, which leads me to this question we have for you. Why can't Catholics just pray directly to Jesus? Why do we have to inter ask Mary and, and no. pray the Hail Mary and the Rosary? And why no. people say, why do we pray to saints and why kneel in front of them? Right. The question is, why do Catholics have to pray to Mary? And I say, we don't. We don't have to pray to Mary. Mm -hmm. The way of Christian prayer is very simple. We pray to the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit, period. That's what prayer is. We're praying to the Father through the work of Christ, who's made us sons, so we can call him Abba Father now, through the work of Christ, by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, it says in Romans chapter 8, that's in us, which groans too deep for words and enable us to pray. Even when we are not feeling like praying, the Holy Spirit is there to help us. That's Christian prayer. That's what we do. Now, what about Mary? Well, I would say to you, I could say, Jude and Therese, you know, we, we've got this situation. Would you please pray for us? And you'd say yes. Now, in English, the word pray means to ask. It doesn't mean to worship. Here's the problem with Christians today. They assume that the word pray means to worship. Worship and pray are equal. If someone prays to Mary, they're worshiping her. You only pray to God. But in English law, we say they come to the judge we pray for leniency your honor 
We pray for this. Pray means to ask in English. When we pray, I, when, I'll use this example. When I was becoming Catholic, my father, the angry Baptist, who was furious at me for thinking of being a Catholic, said, Steve, when you become Catholic, you will pray to Mary and the dead saints. And the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Jesus Christ. There's only one mediator. And I said, Dad, don't you ever ask me to pray for you again, ever. Don't ask me to pray for you again, ever. And my dad says, why not? And I said, because as soon as you ask me to pray for me, for, for you, you put me in the middle. I'm now a, me what does mediator mean? Someone in the middle. Mm -hmm. The median of a road is the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. So when my dad asked me to pray for him, he says, Steve, will you pray for me? I say, sure. Hey, God, my dad wants you to bless him. Will you do that? Sure, I'll do that. Well, thanks. I, I, I know I'm in the middle. My dad should have asked you because there's only one mediator. And I, I know I'm not supposed to be a mediator, but and it, mm -hmm. this is what really happens. See, we would, an intercessor or praying for someone, why would I ask you to pray for me or ask my dad to pray for me? I'm asking them to get in the middle in a way and ask God to do something for me. We call it intercession, but that's still being in the middle. And the, and the thing is, is that when we say there's only one mediator between God and man, we're gee, Paul, whoever wrote Hebrews, is looking at the big picture. Oh, that's in, uh, in Timothy. That, that's looking at the big picture because the mediator, the way I like to view it is you have God over here who is holy and just, apart from sin. Man has fallen into sin, and now there's this big chasm between them. There's a big, a big chasm between the two. And we sinners can't get there. We can't get there because we've sinned. But God sends his son, Jesus, who is like a bridge. The cross is the bridge between sinful mankind down here and a holy God up here. And the cross, Jesus, is the bridge. He is the great mediator that brings God and man back together again. Now, nobody ever thinks they can take over Jesus' job as being the mediator between God and man. That's the big picture. But once Jesus has made that mediation and brought us back together with God, now all of us can share in his mediatorship. All of us. He says, now I want you to share. Not only do I want you to pray for Jude and Trez for me, so that I'll, but I also want you to mediate the other way and go and tell the world about my son. Because when I, God says, Steve, go tell the world about Jesus. I say, okay, God, I will. And then I go tell the guy in the street corner, you need to know Jesus. I'm a mediator that way too. Both ways I'm a mediator. One mediator between God and man is Jesus Christ, the only one that could bridge the big gap. But once that gap is bridged, Jesus invites us to share in his ministry. And now we can also pray for each other. We're not praying to you as God. I'm not praying to Mary as to God, I'm asking Mary to intercede with me or for me to her son, just like I would intercede for my wife to Jesus, to the son, to ask for something. It right. makes so much sense. Now, the problem is people say Mary's dead and gone. The saints are dead and gone. Where in the Bible does it say you should pray to dead saints? Mm -hmm. Well, I say, where in the Bible does it say saints are dead? Mm -hmm. Saints aren't dead. They're very much alive in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. We know Moses at the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is talking to a dead guy. He'd been dead and buried 1,300 years earlier on the other side of the Jordan River on Mount Nebo. How could Jesus be talking to a dead guy? And Moses is aware of what's going on on the earth because they're talking about Jesus' departure soon to take place from Jerusalem. So Jesus is talking to Moses. We know that there are saints in heaven. That's why in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, after chapter 11 talks about all of the Old Testament saints and all their heroics, says, you now had so great a cloud of witnesses around you. Therefore, run the race. You've, he's putting you in the sports arena and you're running the race now for Christ. And the cloud of witnesses are all those saints who are alive, watching and cheering and aware of what's going on down here. And they're interceding for us from the stands, in a way. So the whole idea of the, as saints are dead and gone is totally a misconception mm. because we know that the saints are before God in heaven and they're very much alive. The book of James says that the prayers of a righteous man, righteous man accomplish much. And who's more righteous than the people who are actually with Jesus in heaven and they're interceding for us.
And so we can ask them, please intercede. And it was done by Christians in the early church before the New Testament was ever put together. This New Testament was not collected and put into a book until the end of the fourth century. Before that, even when you go into the catacombs of St. Sebastian in Rome, you see there 614 graffiti, pieces of tile that say, Peter and Paul, pray for us. This was something practiced by the Christians before the New Testament was even put together as a book. Wow. It's amazing. That's boom right there. That's the, uh, that's the theology behind Mary Mediatrix mm -hmm. and the saints. Thank you, Steve. You know, um, I just want to add this, that you cannot honor Mary more than Jesus did, yes. right? I think the only way that you can dishonor him, her, is when you start worshiping her, mm -hmm. yeah, worship. which, is, which is something that we'd like to, you know, which is something that we'd like to hopefully educate our, our fellow Filipino citizens out there. When you um, talk to Filipinos, I've been to the Philippines six times mm -hmm. doing apologetics mm -hmm. and teaching all over the islands from Mindanao to Bahal, north, uh, all over. I haven't mm -hmm. been to the very top part of the Philippines, but all over the central, middle, and in Mindanao. And they have a great veneration for Mama Mary. Mm -hmm. But if you go ask any knowledgeable person there, that understands English or whatever language, Tagalog, if you want to ask him that, mm -hmm. are you worshiping Mary? They will say no. Mm -hmm. They know they're not worshiping Mary. Mm -hmm. She's the mother. She's not God himself. They know that they're worshiping God. There are three words, latria, which means worship in Latin. There's three words for this in Latin. Latria means to worship. It's the adoration that is due only to the Trinity, period. Not to angels, not to Mary, not to Moses, not to my wife. Mm -hmm. Latria is only to the Trinity. But then you have dulia, which means honor, veneration, and you have hyperdulia. That applies to Mary. That just means a whole lot of dulia. Mm -hmm. So we honor the saints. We honor my grandmother. I honor the Queen of England. If I go to London and they invite me to come see Queen Elizabeth II, who's getting very old, she's amazing how long she's been the queen, and they bring me in there, I will bow to her. Aha, Steve Ray just worshipped the queen. I didn't worship the queen. I honored her in the appropriate human way by, you would have to curtsy. I have to bow. Mm -hmm. and that is our way of venerating or honoring the queen in her earthly exalted position. Mary is a queen. Mary is the mother of God. So we dulia her. We honor her. Mary, but because of that, we give her hyper dulia because she holds such a special position as being the mother and being the queen of heaven. Hyper dulia is just the honor and veneration that we owe to human beings or angels, but latria is only for the Trinity alone. And we Catholics make that distinction. And Protestants like to say, well, I saw a Catholic bow down in front of a statue of Mary and pray. They're worshiping her. No, mm -hmm. I, when I was a Protestant, if you would have looked in my bedroom window, you would see this on my bed and you would see me praying over the Bible. And you could say, Steve Ray's worshiping the book. Look at it. He's looking at it. He's bowing down and he's praying. He's He's worshiping the book. No, I'm not. I'm using the book in order to understand and love God better. And we do the same with the saints and Mary. They are people who have lived and are living in heaven. And we look to them not only as examples, like I look to this, the teaching and example, but I also honor them like I honor the Bible, but I don't worship the Bible. It doesn't take the place of God, nor do I worship Mary or the angels. Now, let's go back to the Ark of the Covenant real quick. Mm -hmm. What was the most precious and venerated article in the temple for the Jews? It was the Ark of the Covenant. Everything else was secondary. The Ark of the Covenant is where God dwelled. And the Shekinah glory was always billowing and bubbling above the Ark of the Covenant. The glory, the presence of God, because the Ark of the Covenant was that the marked the presence of God. Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. There was a man named Uzzah. And as the ark was going along, once it wasn't being carried by the Kohathites, it was being carried on an ox cart. And it started to tip. And Uzzah reached out and tried to touch it and straighten it out. And he was, boom, dropped dead right on the spot because he touched a holy thing. Right. Now, Mary is the ark of the covenant. And if 
Uzzah dropped dead because he touched the Ark of the Covenant. What does that tell us about Mary? That she's all holy. She's also a holy item in God's eyes. Now, do the Jews worship the box? Did they come to the temple to worship this box? No. What did they worship? There was a glory cloud above it. That was the presence of God. They came to worship the presence of God manifested in a cloud over the Ark of the Covenant. And when we see people bowing to Mary, they are not worshiping Mary. They are honoring all holy Mary. What they're worshiping is the baby in her arms or the baby in her womb. We have to make the distinction, just like the Jews made the distinction between the ark and the glory cloud of God above. We make a distinction, nor do we worship the ark of the new covenant, Mary. We worship the glory cloud that's in her arms. And when we acknowledge and we pray, asking her to intercede for us, we do not have to pray to her. We do not worship her. But when we do come before her and as the queen of heaven, who is an intercessor for the people, we are doing the same thing the Jews did with the ark. They're venerating the ark. They're worshiping the glory cloud above it, which is Jesus. Wow. Wow. This is why I learned more about Mary from the Old Testament than from the New. But once you understand the Old Testament, all of a sudden the New Testament is like widescreen technicolor mm -hmm. video. It's like a big aha moment. I mean, on statues, the Catholic Church has consistently condemned idolatry right? The Catechism of the Council of Trent in 1566 actually is very explicit about this. And, and, and for our fellow Filipinos, it is when one assigns divinity or powers to the statues. And this is where we really can get, um, uh, can get criticized and we can get really um, uh, dissected about our faith. Uh, we are consistent. The Catechism of the Catholic Church consistently condemns uh, 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 idolatry. Anyway, you had something well, let's, about that. Let's touch on that really quickly. Mm -hmm. God broke his own rules. He said, don't make any image above the earth, on the earth, or below the earth to bow down and worship it. Mm -hmm. So you have two aspects there. You make an image for what purpose? To bow down and worship it as a divinity, what you just said. Jude. So God then broke his rules by telling them to make images of angels. That's above the earth. Then they made images of pomegranates that they had to put in the Ark of the Covenant. They had a curtain, and it was woven with pomegranates. That's something on the earth. And then God tells them when the serpents are biting them to make a pole and put it up on it, which represents Satan. That's something under the earth. Mm -hmm. So God, now God is telling them to make all these images. He's forgetting what he said in Exodus chapter 20. No, he just did not. That's not a prohibition against images. As It's the second part to bow down and worship them as deities, which we as Catholics do not do. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. God really broke his rules then. He, you're not supposed to make any image of a divine. And it says that he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. In other words, God made himself known in an image. Yeah. Jesus is that image. And if you were there and there's Jesus and you had a camera and you took a picture of him, you'd have an image of the image. Mm -hmm. He, once he becomes man, it's now images are okay because Jesus himself took on an image and then we can reflect that. We can reflect that image. Now, my mom said to me when I was becoming Catholic, Steve, when you become Catholic, you're going to have statues. Statues of Mary in the Bible says you should have no statues or images. It happened to be Christmas. And what did my mom have on her table? The nativity scene. manger scene. A nativity okay. scene. I said, Mom, you have a statue of Mary right there on your kitchen table. There's Joseph, and you have a statue of Jesus. Mm -hmm. She said, well, that's different. And I said, how is it different? That is an image. You say that I'm wrong because I have an image of Mary, but you have an image of Mary right there. I always like to say that December, I know in the Philippines, all the Burr months are for you guys. Christmas, <laughs> yes. October, November, December, yeah, right. all of those are already Christmas. It's the blessed time of year when even Protestants can have statues of Mary. <laughs> Christmas is such a blessed time that even Protestants have statues of Mary without thinking about it. Well, my mom said also, you're going to have Jesus on the cross. Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. You shouldn't have that image of him on the cross. He's alive and in heaven. You Catholics worship a Jesus still on the cross. We Protestants worship a live Jesus in heaven. I said, well, mom, Jesus isn't in the manger anymore either. Mm -hmm. 
You put Jesus in the manger, but he's not there anymore either. He's in heaven. We recognize and remember him like I carry a picture of my wife. And if I'm away from my wife for a while, I don't mind pulling that picture up, kissing that picture of my wife. I'm not honoring her as God. Mm -hmm. I'm not violating the law about making an image. And that is an image of my wife. You may say an image, two-dimensional picture, three-dimensional statue, irrelevant. Jesus does, God did not make a distinction between two-dimensional and three-dimensional. He says, make no images, graven images. I can have a picture of my wife and kiss her when I'm away from her. It show, does nothing about worshiping her. God loves it when I love my wife like that. And God loves it when we love the mother of God like that. Yeah. And even the early church used icons and images to, to, um, uh, for education purposes mm -hmm. and, and to, uh, particularly for those who are illiterate. Yeah. Yeah. The gospel of the poor. So how many minutes? Sorry. Are you okay, Steve, that we, we went beyond the oh, hour? Yes, yeah. I'm fine. Okay. All right. Well, I, just talking about statues and images, what a historical moment right now that we have seen statues being taken down and burned and like the Saint, uh, Saint Junipero Serra. So it, it's just timely that we talk about these, that we don't worship statues. Mm -hmm. And it's just- The whole thing is, is chaos. It's anarchy. It's Marxism. It's total lunacy what's going mm -hmm. on in our country today with the tearing down of statues. But the fact is, is that even Christians and Catholics accept the statue of Martin Luther or Lincoln, Abraham mm -hmm. Lincoln. You don't mm -hmm. see the, cat, the Protestants going and tearing them down because, oh, they're images. They don't have any problem with, most Protestants have no problem with images of Martin Luther. I went to Germany in 2017, which is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's deformation, and everywhere was statues of Luther. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. We wow. followed all the footprints of Luther and we argued with him along the way. But everywhere we went, there were statues of Martin Luther and his theologian Melanchthon, and there were statues of Zwingli and Bucer. All of these reformers, nobody has a problem with those statues. So it's very selective. Protestants are very selective. They have pictures of their mother on the wall. I was raised with a picture of Jesus on the wall at dinner time every time. And we saw that picture all the time. Jesus and Mary and Joseph in this in the manger scene. It's just there's a very inconsistency among Protestants. If they want to be consistent, then get rid of all of your pictures. Get rid of all of your images. Do what the Muslims do. Have Stop being no on Facebook. Images of anything. <laughs> right. Get rid of Facebook and everything else because I'm looking at an image of you right now. Uh -huh. I'm not looking at you, Tris, or Juju. I'm looking at an image of you, which is colored pixels on my MacBook Pro screen. And mm -hmm. I should not be able to do that because there are no images. Right. That's right. true. So a Protestant to be consistent should get rid of every picture of his family, every picture of his mother, take that and be like the Muslims who refuse to have any images of anything or any people. But even yeah. they have pictures of themselves. Yeah, I like it when you don't have to be Catholic to understand when, when people go to their father's grave and visit him and they say, oh, I know my father's looking down from heaven for me and prays for me. That right. to me is exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't worship our father when I visit my father in his grave. Right. But I do know, I believe, if, if, for, if I believe in eternal life, mm -hmm. he's in heaven and he's looking down on me and praying for me, interceding for me. My mother said to me that she did not want to go to the grave of my father because that wasn't dad. When we buried my dad, he's 94 years old. That was seven years ago. My mom is now 98 and a half. She still doesn't want to go visit the grave because she said, that's not dad. Dad's in heaven. I said, no, mom, dad is in heaven and dad is in the ground. Dad's body was a temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm. The Holy Spirit of God indwelled that body, and that body is still in the ground. That is still a temple of the Holy Spirit. And God is very jealous of that body, and he watches that body all the time because at the end of time, mm -hmm. he's going to raise my dad's body up, and it's going to meet with my dad's soul and spirit in heaven, and he's going to become one again. We're going to have bodies in heaven. God likes stuff. God made stuff. And when he made our bodies, he said, it is very good. He loves our body and our soul. And yes, dad is in heaven praying for me and looking out. And I say to my mom, I said, dad loves coffee. I think every morning dad goes up to the throne of Jesus and says, uh, you want a cup of coffee? I'll get you one. Brings it to you. And then he says, 
Um, Jesus, my wife down there, could you bless her today? She's kind of sad that I'm gone. Would you bless her? And Jesus, sure, I'll do that. That's the same thing Mary does for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're in the presence of God. Who says that my dad can't go to Jesus in heaven and ask him to do something for me? And because my dad's alive and a saint in heaven, it says in Revelation that the angels are carrying the prayers of the saints up in golden bowls into heaven. Wow. I believe that when I ask my mom, my dad or Mary to pray for me, the angels take that in a golden bowl in the book of Revelation and they take it up to the throne of God. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> you know, our, our last topic is about the role of, of Mary in salvation history. You know, what's the fuss about Mary? You know, she just gave birth to Jesus. She was just an instrument. But uh, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux in his, in his uh, exegesis says it very explicitly. When the angel uh, uh, came to Mary, he waited. He awaited for her answer, for her fiat, for her yes. And as soon as she said yes, the word became flesh. And that's when there was a guaranteed salvation for an entire uh, human race. So what's the big deal about Mary? It's, it's, she was an integral part of, um, of salvation history. Won't you say so, Steve? The way my wife views it <clears throat> is that this had been the plan from the beginning, but Mary still had free will. Mm -hmm. For a Jewish girl to be pregnant out of wedlock was a capital offense. In the Old Testament, if a woman had sex outside of marriage and had a baby, because of that sin, they would take her outside the city and stone her to death. That was the Old Testament law. Mm -hmm. When Mary has the angel come to her and say, you're going to have a baby by the Holy Spirit. And she knows she is betrothed to Joseph, but they don't live together yet. There's no marriage in the sense of coming together. It's just the legal thing. And Mary said yes. And she knows that she's going to start showing before the marriage. Mm -hmm. That she also, that's another moment of sorrow for Mary. We don't realize it, but she's saying, yes, it's a very dangerous thing for a girl to be pregnant without being married. And she still said, yes. But if I was Mary, I would have said, dear mm -hmm. angel, I'm very grateful for this. I'll do it. But would you please tell everybody else in Nazareth what you just told me? That's true. <laughs> And Mary holds that special place of salvation history and bring, giving birth to the Son of God, to God himself in the flesh. And she said yes to that. And I think one of the most poignant parts of that passage in the Annunciation is the last verse, where it says the angel left her. And here's a 15-year-old girl that just got this unbelievable message. How do you process that message? You're going to give birth to the king. There's not been a king for 600 years. Mm -hmm. You're going to, and then later she learns a sword will pierce your soul as well. What does that mean? How does a 15 year old girl process this? Mm -hmm. I think the first thing she did is went, mom. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what Mary did for us. She said, yes. And my wife sees it this way, that when God said to the angel, Gabriel, go down and bring the message. Let's see what happens. She has to say yes. And Mary still has a free will. And yes, we planned it all. We prepared it all. It's ready to go. Go down and tell her. And my wife says that when the angel went down, God went, all of heaven held their breath. All through the universe, there was silence. What's she going to say? But Mary said, do it unto me. According to your word. God and all of creation went, oh, she said yes. Beautiful. Why is Mary special? Because she's the one that said yes to all the universe. She is the woman of Genesis chapter 3, 14, who would bring enmity between Satan and the seed, her son. She's the one that gave birth to him. She is, she ha, he has her DNA. She's the one that told Jesus when it's time for his earthly ministry to begin. She was there at the foot of the cross giving her son up as a sacrifice. She is the queen of heaven now. And if you want to know more about Mary, just get to know your Old Testament. Oh. Right, right. Beautiful. What a great way to conclude it, right? Yeah, so <sighs> in this day and age, especially when we see our society, you know, teaching our children that there is no God. What better way to, to instill in our children 
the 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 love of the scriptures found through through getting to know Mary because she is the f- model of our faith, a model of faith, hope, and love. When you mention how, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be done unto me according to your word. She is, she's, I'm your female servant. I will say yes. And yeah. the, nowadays, you don't want to say yes. You don't love rule. You don't like no one. No one likes rules. You know, they will just believe in their own truth. My truth, your truth, I don't care. But this is just beautiful to to even figure out, well, what do we do now? Here is the role of Mary in the salvation history from even before. And if we continue w- walking through Mary w- to learn about Jesus, then I think we have hope. We have hope for our children. Right, right. What a perfect example when she said, let it be done according to your word you know how many times do we have we felt in our own lives where we are where jesus is asking us to do something and it's maybe insurmountable or unbearable or maybe there are trials in our lives and it's and we're having such a difficult time and when we look at this 14 15 year old girl uh, uh ready to be stoned to death saying let it be done to me according to your word that should be a source of inspiration for us exactly. see how that fiat that, yes, leads us closer to Jesus, right? Anyway, Steve, it's uh, 627. We, we really appreciate you. I mean, this is amazing. Um, we could talk the whole day. We could talk the whole day to you and <laughs> soak in every knowledge that you have. Um, maybe, maybe we could have you again at some point in time. Good. I love it. Yeah. Yes. Thank I you, I love Steve. the Filipino people. I think they're the best people in the world. I think that they are very genuine in their faith. <clears throat> but you on that island, you're celebrating uh, 500 years. Next year, yeah. Catholic mm-hmm. country. You are the gateway to Asia. I think God has given the Filipinos the obligation to send the gospel into Asia. You're the gateway to Asia. You're the entrance. And for 500 years, you've been very loyal and faithful as a nation. But because you were never attacked before, you were never challenged in your faith, the Filipino people that now all of a sudden in the last 50 years, all these cults and sects and denominations, and many of them from our country, United States, have flooded your islands, trying to tell you that you're wrong, quoting verses out of context from the Bible. And Filipinos, in their great desire and love for God, I think more than any nation on the earth, are easy prey for these groups to pull them out of the Catholic Church away from the truth because they have never been taught to defend themselves. It's like in the United States when you had the American Indians, when the Europeans came here with viruses that they didn't have, the Indians and Native Americans died out. A lot of them died out because they didn't have any immunities to those. We're also seeing this whole thing with viruses today. The real thing that's going to get us out of this is to get immunities to it eventually. But you, you have the Filipino people, in a sense, they love the Lord, but these other viruses came in and started, they were so susceptible because they loved the Lord so much in a way. And I have a great desire to see the Catholics in the Philippines understand the Catholic Church, be strong in it, learn how to defend it, to be defenders of the Catholic Church, not become victims of those who pull them out of the Catholic Church. So I'm happy to do this with you anytime. I wrote a letter to the Filipino people, and I think you, maybe you could put it up on your website on Facebook so that the Filipino people could read that letter that I wrote to them probably 10 years ago, but it still goes around news around around every year. Right. But uh, I love the Filipino people, and that's why I'm willing to spend any time necessary to help them learn to understand and defend their faith and to bring those who have left back into the church. Thank you, Steve. And the Filipino people love you. They, they, you, they know, we realize that you are spirit-filled. By the way, where can they, if they wish to find you, where can they find you? What are you up to next? Uh, I know you're busy. You've got programs lined up for the entire year, I think. Um, tell, tell us, us about that free conference that you mentioned mm-hmm. that you were going yeah, to. On Monday and Tuesday, I have a free conference. We're going to do a talk on Mary two-hour talk on Mary. Mary, the first talk is going to be on the real girl, what it was like for her to live. And the second talk is the woman of mystery about her as the queen of heaven and so on. I'm also going to be talk, giving my conversion story. I'm going to be talking about defending the Eucharist and also swimming upstream, how to live Catholic life in a pagan world. And if you go to my website, catholicconvert.com. I have it up how to get a hold of that. It's a free seminar. You just send an email and then register and we're on there all day Monday and Tuesday and it's free. 
and it's going to be Zoom like this. I'm going to be giving those talks live. Okay, CatholicConvert.com. CatholicConvert.com. I have all my pilgrimages up there. I have all of our books. I have a store there available. Um, I have a good friend in Manila named Henry C. S. I. E. And he has a great bookstore. And it's called Totus Tuus. Mm -hmm. And any books for people in the Philippines, that's a great source. He's got an ex unbelievably beautiful bookstore and all the books and tapes and apologetics. And it's, his name's Henry C. S. I. Y. And it's Totus called, and Green Hills. And maybe you could put the link up for that too on your website. That would be a good source in the Philippines for people to get the best of Catholic literature and defense. And it's good for Catholics to learn a little bit of Catholic karate. Yeah, good to know some Catholic karate. Learn how to defend yourself and your family. And so you could find the books of Steve yep. at for the for Filipino viewers at Henry C's Totus Bookstore. Totus Bookstore. Mm -hmm. And these books are more expensive in the United States. They're in Filipino editions where they're much, much less expensive. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. buy them there. Right. Thank you, Steve. We will let you go. Thank you very much. And for our viewers, uh, we'll keep you uh We'll, 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 just, wrap we'll just wrap up after uh, Steve leaves and then uh, we'll do some announcements. Well, good. Thank you very much. God bless you all. God bless you, Steve. Have a great Thank you weekend. and happy feast of, we are so glad to have you today, the feast of St. Benedict. Good. Yeah. I amen. Love it. Yeah. Yes. God bless you, God Steve. Bless you, Thank Steve. you. Marami bye, bye Yeah. So for our, uh, for our viewers, we are concluding, but it, it's this, right? Uh, we talked about Mary. We talk, talked about the saints. We talked about typology. We addressed the common misconceptions about our uh, uh, praying to Mary, about praying to saints, our religious use of statues, uh, and what the catechism, what the catechism of the Catholic Church really teaches. Do you want to read that? Um, here, why don't you? Um, so in, in, the, uh, in paragraph 487 the of the catechism of the Catholic Church, it says, what the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ, well, what do you know? And what it teaches about Mary illumines in turn its faith in Christ. So Mary just simply points towards Christ. She is the fullness of what Christ's, Christ's mercy and what God's mercy is all about, outside of the Godhead. Anyway, in conclusion, it's as simple as simple can be, right? We proclaim that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior of the world, we, uh, and we call everyone to repent, believe, and endure in the faith. But if it's amazing, because if you really want to dive deep into the Catholic faith, I mean, you could spend 20 lifetimes, and, and, and it's so rich, you won't be able to, to uh, really comprehend everything. And, and people ask, you know, so what's a, what's a physician and, and, and a nurse with a master's in special ed doing, uh, talking about, uh, about uh, the catechisms of the Catholic Church? We are, we, we are just, we are, it's our studentship. We are learning so much about this. It's, it's, it's amazing. And um, we, we just want to share. Yes. And to conclude, as for me, as a person, why do I love Mary? Again, I don't worship Mary. Honestly, we do, Catholics don't worship Mary. We honor her because there has never been a woman in the life of our Lord that he loved the most mm -hmm. than Mary. And so anyone that Jesus loved most especially, then we ought to love her also. So why do I love Mary in the manner that I do? Because I am just so glad, hun, that we have mothers, yours and mine, mm -hmm. who were not selfish. Why? Because they taught your mom and mine, they taught us Mary, who is her spiritual mother, the queen of heaven and earth. They could have said no, don't i'm your mother alone i am your mother here on earth but no she my our mothers taught us how to love mary because if you want to love and get to know god more then you would like to get to know the vessel from where jesus was born from mm -hmm. and and i think this is where that's why we pray the hail mary not to pray to mary but but in the intercession of mary as a mother who is that woman who felt rejected, who felt condemned, who felt that maybe she could have been stoned 
to mm -hmm. death because of an act of adultery. She was seen pregnant already when she was mm -hmm. not even married. And for her to see her son suffer a Roman execution at the foot of the cross and all of the apostles except John were there in Calvary, for her to stand there in grief and agony, to me at this day and age, I'm 47, there are many actors and actresses we can be inspired from, but I can't be inspired from uh, anyone except right. Mary. Not because, more inspirational. Yes, than because I see her, her, her faith, her hope, and her love is just so pure, and it makes me want to be a better person mm -hmm. and a better Catholic or a better Christian. Mm -hmm. And and I have this visual. Sorry, I have this visual imagery. What Mary is in my life, I feel like we're all toddlers. You know, we don't quite get it sometimes what Jesus teaches us because some of them are too radical. And here we are, we are, I'm like a toddler and Mother Mary is holding me by the hand and, and says, hey child, I, come, I'll hold your hand. I'll lead you to my son. And she's there making me get to know her son even more. Like as if you're in a GPS, you don't know the address, you get to know the address. Like Jesus, to me, Mary, to us is... Mary is like the address. You you type the address on your phone. You get to know where to go. She's the GPS that leads to the address. Exactly. Right? That leads to the address. That leads to the house. Right? right? right. Yes. Right. Anyway, folks, uh, next week. Next week would be amazing. We will have uh, Chris Stefanik. Uh, that would be Saturday, Philippine time. Uh, he's a, he's a consultant to the United States Con uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops and Lady, Marriage, Family, Life, and Youth. He is an internationally acclaimed author and speaker. And then the next day, you're going to get Scott Hahn. I mean, I, should, I, I couldn't even read through this. It's, it's, he's, his bio is probably about a couple of pages long. We will inter everybody knows him. Uh, so please stay tuned to Empower Philippines. Like our page. Follow us. Turn on live stream notifications. Uh, send us messages. Uh, uh, we have a lot of wonderful, inspirational guests, thought leaders, great Christians uh, who would be guesting in our, in our Coffee Conversations program. If I'm not mistaken, that weekend, next weekend, we will have a sort of a feast. A back to back. Meaning a within just a 12 hour period, we have first you have Chris Stefanik and then Scott Hahn. I apologize, I don't quite know the time, but we will show you the poster. I think you have seen it also before. Right. And may we request how you felt today, how the Lord touched you today. Please let us know in your comments below Empower Philippines. And so shall we wrap yep. up with a prayer? Yes. Would you like to say a prayer? Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be with Steve Ray, to get enlightened uh, about your mother and how her life was part of salvation history, how her fiat is an example to us of pure faith and devotion to your will. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, be with us. Be with our family. These are times that are unprecedented. Uh, um, we ask for your presence and your guidance. Thank you very much, Jesus. As we pray, hail Mary. Full, full of grace, grace the Lord, Lord is with you. you. Blessed are you amongst you women, and blessed is the fruit of, of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, of God pray, for pray for us sinners, us now, now and at the hour of our death. Our death. Amen. Amen. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Empowerers. We love you. We will see you again next week. Maraming salamat. Maraming salamat po. Have a good evening and good morning. Thank you. <laughs>